So let me welcome all of you to IIT Bombay. Thank you very much for uh, participating in this workshop, which is going to be a two-day workshop on environmental geotechnics. And uh, this is uh, supported by IUSSTF, that is Indo-US Science and Technology uh, Forum, uh, which is located in New Delhi. And uh, in the meantime, what I'll request is that uh, you can start uh, a brief round of introduction. Professor Chandel. Good morning, Dr. Ramon. I am from Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust, Nehru Bay. I am mostly working on Indian environmental policy and also on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean Management and Conservation Act. I am working on the Indian Ocean static and seismic behavior of combined pile rock formation. Good morning everyone. I am the MUM and I am in the second year of it. And uh, my research project is about the uh, pile formation. Good morning everyone. My name is Imran Ging and I am an FX engineer student from Geotechnical Engineering. And my research topic is rigid diagonal and mechanical methods for stabilized black water cells. Hi everyone. I am Arjun Mohan from IIT Bombay. I am a PhD scholar. I am working on vascular research and experimental. I am Sarath Mohan from IIT Bombay. I am working on this wash stabilization, particularly for my research. Good morning. I am Dr. Vijay Sundar. Actually, I am an alumni. I am a PhD student from IIT Bombay. Right now, I am in the next level. I am in the next level. And uh, I work on the industrial waste replacement company. And uh, recently, we are uh, also active in developing artificial materials <coughs> by utilizing the design products. Thank you, sir. I said that today. I am from IIT Mandi. I am a student of IIT Mandi. Uh, I am here to present the product. Soon, we will be hearing from you. So, just support us on the slide. Myself, Vidya. I am a student of the IIT Parikar. And my interest is in environmental geotechnics and geosynthetics and ground. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Amman from Technical 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 Technical. So, I am working on uh, sustainable pages from the soil based pages. Yeah, I'm Shizma, working on the research science. I work in the area of uh, land things. We are discussing. Babu happens to be the of uh, Indian Geotechnical Society also. Hi, good morning. Uh, I am David Krishna. I am from this department. Of course, I am a man out here. I am Geotechnical Chair of the department. And uh, he has been heading the department since six, seven years. Six years. And um, he is a transportation engineering uh, professional. Uh, good morning all. My name is Arvind Patil. Uh, I work in CD, Center for Distance Engineering Education Program at IIT Bombay. And today I am here uh, just to make few announcements about the event that is today and tomorrow happening here to capture it and make it available in public domain later on. Thank you. Okay, so, so I just need to tell that uh, uh, there is a small formality for us to facilitate this recording of today and tomorrow being available in the public domain. There is a small form which a copy of 
will be given to all of you i request all of you to please sign it it just says that you are authorizing us to make it public uh, as such uh, this course uh, environment geo techniques is taught as many as five times by professor dn singh here and those earlier recordings are also available on the cd web page so uh, those of you who want to view the previous recording get more insights on this is also available so this is the uh, web address and here in the access course courses access courses link just need to create your new login which is which you yourself can create by sharing your email address and few other details and then you could go to enroll new course and i will just show you one place where this course the last edition of this course was in spring 2016 2017 2007 so here here is the link available once you enroll you could be uh, viewing the videos of this course So the idea of inviting uh, Mr. Patel here was to inform you that this workshop is being recorded, and for the interest of the public, and uh, anybody can access it from anywhere. And uh, we wanted this workshop to be recorded and kept on the CD portal, which is very frequently visited by most of the students and the professionals from India, all over the country. and this is where mr patel brought this to my notice that there is a form declaration form which has to be signed by uh, people who are going to present their uh, ppts over here so please read this carefully and there are some ipr issues which are associated with this recording and hence you are free to tell us whether you want this to be recorded or not uh, i think this is what actually he wanted to convey the message thank you in case you have any query mr patel is available and you can speak to him thank you we'll continue with the round of introduction okay thank you um i'm dr charles nap i'm an associate professor or in, in uk is called senior lecturer um in civil and environmental engineering at the university of strathclyde which is in glasgow uk um i am an environmental scientist with um a strong emphasis in microbiology and its interactions with the environment good morning everybody i am paras uh, ranjan pujari i am from the national environmental engineering research institute nagpur and i am basically a geophysicist by training and uh, my broad uh, research area is basically near subsurface near subsurface geoscience with a specific uh, focus on environment and as far as the geotechnics is concerned one area that uh, which i am keenly interested is the i think non invasive uh, mapping of any leachate from these uh, waste disposal sites and uh, i have uh, used geophysical tools like resistivity imaging near waste disposal sites and i have some work to that uh, in that area thank you good morning uh, my name is narayan neethalat i am a professor of structural engineering and materials at arizona state university in tempe arizona um i do mostly concrete cement and concrete based materials but i do a lot of computational modeling and therefore do particle scale modeling of uh, of geo based systems also hello my name is megan hart i am an environmental geotechnical engineer at the university of missouri kansas city um i'm an assistant professor my areas are permeable reactive materials and waste byproduct reuse and geotechnical applications Hi my name is Arvin Farid and I guess there's a name Arvin <clears throat> I'm feeling better but not quite well uh, uh I uh, I uh, get this that my first name is Arvin and apparently there's a name Arvind in India so so very similar so that's a common thing at least five letters I'm an associate professor and graduate coordinator at Boise State University I'm also the vice chair of the GOACGI uh, geo environmental committee um and 
My background is in uh, civil and electrical engineering, geotechnical and geo-environmental. I've done uh, some geophysics as well and have uh, interest in multi-scale, multi-physics, uh, computational modeling as well. So I'll show some of the projects and, and you'll see uh, what I've done in the past. Okay. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Myself, Prabhi Kole. Uh, I'm from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Uh, my specialization is geotechnical, obviously, and then uh, mostly sustainable use of geomaterial, and also do ground improvement and liquefaction, and also uh, concrete and concrete. Sustainable. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anoop C K from Civil Engineering Department, faculty at Vishwajyoti College of Engineering and Technology, Kerala. My research area is on hydrology and climate studies. Thank you. A warm good, good morning, one and all. I am Lijit KP, first year PhD research scholar working under the guidance of Professor uh, D.N. Singh. My area of research is uh, ge geomechanical modeling of gas hydrated bearing sediments. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deepak Raj. By education, I am a geotechnical engineer. And I work for Keller's Indian Business Unit. And Keller is normally involved in globally into providing foundation and geotechnical solutions. And we used uh, provide uh, innovative solutions to waste fill and you know landfill. And that brought my interest into this workshop. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am a undergrad here at IIT Bombay. I had the pleasure of doing work under D.N. Singh and he asked me to attend this meeting, so it's a learning curve for me. Good morning everybody, I'm Farhanaz Darikande and a PhD scholar in IIT Bombay. Currently I'm working on the stabilization of expansive soil using the byproduct and thank you to Ms. Professor Singh to arranging this workshop. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Rashmi Gupta. I'm MT Chemical Engineer, and I'm currently working in Hindalco Industries Limited in its uh, innovation, innovation center in R&D department. And currently, I'm working on projects uh, related to values from waste. Thank you. Good morning. I am Chandana. I'm a research scholar working under Professor D. N. Singh. And my research area is decontamination of geomaterials. Good morning everyone present here. My name is Bini and I am working in synthesis of gas hydrates and sediments. Good morning all of you. Uh, myself Bharti Banshiwal and I am a first year master's student here. Good morning everyone. Uh, I am Puneet Rathi from IIT Bombay. I am currently a second year MTech student uh, working under the supervision of Professor D.N. Singh and my area of project is thermohydromechanical behavior of soils. Good morning all, I am Agnes. I am a research scholar working with Professor D.N. Singh and my research area is municipal solid waste management in bioreactor landfills. Good morning one and all. Myself, Sainish, I am a research scholar working under the supervision of Professor D.N. Singh. My area of research is geo-environmental issues pertaining to open cast mining. Good morning, I am Akshita Jha. I am from Hindalco Innovation Center and I am working on sustainability projects of Hindalco. Good morning all, I am Shashank. I am a uh, fourth year research scholar. I am working in the area of uh, biogeo interface under the supervision of uh, Professor D.N. Singh. University of Missouri, Kansas City, MO. USA. The preamble for the workshop is, it is not a conference in our opinion and it is not even a lecture session. <coughs> what is more we have to emphasize is on discussions And why we are discussing things? Because we want to create new research ideas, new research areas. And we have almost several engineering colleges and institutions being represented from India, industry, academics from US and UK. We should collaborate. And this is where we 
have to think of interdisciplinary research ideas and how to implement them. So, the way I take this workshop is it's a platform for the like minded people to know each other and collaborate. In no way, it's a conference and it's not a lecture session. The aims and objectives are to identify key areas of research and applications, industry, academia, interaction, nurture and support researchers for taking up challenging engineering problems related to environmental geotechnics. This is very important pilot scale solutions and working models which we want to implement in India in collaboration with our colleagues from different parts of the world and particularly US and UK and the industry from India. So, collaboration is the key word between the researchers and professionals from different backgrounds to develop novel interdisciplinary approaches. So, in this context my request is that let the conduct of the workshop be like this. Let us talk about the thematic ideas, thematic presentations and followed by discussion and the brainstorming on each topic. What we have realized is that there are few emerging themes which are very pertinent in environmental geotechnics out of which the first one is environmental geotechnics sorry in energy geotechnics. Another colleague Marcelo will be joining today night and he is going to discuss in details the energy geotechnics and the concepts particularly thermophysics of the geomaterials, sustainability issues most of my colleagues who are here are talking about sustainability is a key word. There is a lot of emphasis on instrumentation and sensing. We are also going to talk about cold region geomechanics, bio geo interface is something which is catching up in India as well as in most of the parts of the world. And I am very thankful to Charles for coming here all the way. He is a microbiologist par excellence. He is teaching us the concepts of bio geo interface and to me and to my students and those who are interested in collaborating. Uh, contamination in geo environment, soil, rock and water is going to be a theme area and environmental geophysics uh, as you were talking about. Another interesting part of this uh, workshop would be education practice and law. Uh, Dr. Desh Pandey who was the NGT member and he is going to talk about uh, environmental prejudice and the laws which are associated with practice of environmental geotechnics in contemporary India. I look forward for your cooperation and active participation. Thank you. Uh, before I hand over the mic to uh, Megan, uh, one request is that uh, we should generate a lot of discussion and we should come out with the area which we can work on further. Well, welcome. Um, I appreciate you all coming here and uh, discussing environmental geotechnics with us. Um, I think that there is a lot of room for us to improve the industry as well as our knowledge of geotechnical applications and as it relates to the environment. Um, areas that I have found particularly useful in the last um, I don't know, last two or three years have been the reuse of waste byproducts uh, for applications in geoenvironmental. So using waste byproducts to supplement remediation or the products that can't be used for other applications um, in a new application. Any type of valorization I think is useful. One of the industries in particular um, other than bauxite and mining um, and their red mud is slag and fly ash. Uh, and the different types of uses you can use fly ash or bottom ash or um, the gypsum board that is formed. Um, things that we do with that is you can um, use it to, to entrain in a 
filter type media, usually a cellular concrete or a cementitious pellet type material, um, and you can remove lots and lots of different things. Um, if you induce electromagnetic waves with it or other type of gamma sources, uh, like a gamma source or a um, energy source, you can also improve your remedial activities. Um, hopefully we can all find some common ground to discuss future activities and uh, come together and find some research activities for us all. May I request no Professor Krishna Rao, our head of the department, chair of the department, to speak few words and present the activities of the departments. So, good morning to you all and also a warm welcome uh, to this very interesting and important workshop. So, I think there are participants from of course, uh, United States, UK and every part of our country. So, welcome you all to this maximum city of Mumbai. Of course, it gives uh, great opportunities for us. It is actually a live laboratory, which Professor D. N. Singh definitely agree with me. And he is responsible for many, many infrastructure projects to take shape here. And in fact, our department as a whole. At the outset, let me congratulate uh, Professor D. N. Singh as well as uh, Megan Hart, Professor Megan Hart. Indian counterpart, US counterpart for making this bilateral Indo-US workshop a reality. And also thanks to Indo-US uh, Science and Technology Forum uh, for granting the funds for conducting this workshop. So, I will say a few words about uh, our civil engineering department. Of course, basically I am also, I, I am very pleased to uh, hear some of the topics which talk about uh, the sustainability. Of course, I myself work in sustainable urban transportation. So, my job is to prepare plans which are, which create finally sustainable transportation in urban areas. And also of course, other things are uh, very scary and Greek and Latin for me, uh, which also scares me because as a civil engineer, I need to also know biology, chemistry and Professor D. N. Singh, I should appreciate, he is not at all uh, afraid of these things. He has gone into depth and he is actually beating biologists and chemists in, on this count. And of course, he is a great achiever. Uh, I think in the institute, maybe he is number one in terms of PhD graduations, the impact that he makes in terms of publications, not only just impact factor of journals, but the impact out there on the society. So, that way I am very glad that uh, we are all gathered here. And if you see the audience, I think many of them are his students and he has not shown much partiality there because I also see a large number of uh, people coming from uh, rest of India who are not his students, but uh, everybody would like to be a student of Prasidian Singh. Okay, so with these uh, remarks, I will uh, just briefly tell you about our department. Uh, before that about our institute, those of course, you are all familiar. And I also take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor uh, Sukumar Babu from ISC Bangalore. Uh, from ISC Bangalore, I think we have quite a few faculty. So, thanks to them for giving faculty to IIT Bombay. And of course, we have a friendly competition. You must be hearing about the rankings of IIT Bombay. <laughs> and of course, rankings apart, but the main thing is we need to uh, work hard and make a difference. So, IIT Bombay of course, uh, has grown in leaps and bounds in the recent years and you may be surprised to know that now the student strength of IIT Bombay is more than 10,000. In fact, when we joined it was uh, around 3,000 20 years back, but 10 years back also it was around 4,000, but within 10 years we have almost more than doubled it. So, one of the important aspects is out of 10,000, 60 percent of the students are actually either PhD students or master's students. And even out of those 6,000, more than 3,000, right now I think 3,600 or so close to 4,000 are actually uh, carrying out research here towards their PhD degree. And we are graduating close to 350 PhD students every year. It may reach, uh, I think maybe next convocation, it may be 400. Okay, coming back to my department, uh, so welcome you all to IIT Bombay. 
uh, as well as to the civil engineering department. Of course, we are there from the beginning when the institute has actually started in 1958. Of course, our aim is to impart uh, good education at the same time carry out high end research to make a difference. This is about the human resource in the department. So, you can see uh, there are about 450 undergraduate students on rolls, 150 masters students on rolls. The important striking thing is we have 245 PhD scholars on rolls. And our faculty, we have about uh, close to 50 faculty members. And we also have a very good collaboration with foreign universities. One of the very important collaboration uh, that actually relies even in a physical manner bringing a building here and forming an academy, IIT Bombay Monash Research Academy. In fact, this academy itself has about 180 students on rolls. All of them are doing PhD. We finally give joint PhD uh, a single certificate from IIT Bombay as well as Monash University. And of course, Professor D. N. Singh also has a lot of contribution in that. And uh, we are also getting now foreign students, masters and so one of the foreign students is here. Okay, so uh, Farhanaz, Farhanaz is here. Yeah. And uh, we have students from Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, uh, Nepal, uh, and France, US, a lot of them come here as visiting students. And we also have uh, started, of course, civil engineering department, it is a little slow, uh, whereas at the institute level, we have about uh, 150 postdoctoral fellows. So, civil engineering department has about five of them right now, but our aim is to each faculty should also have a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, in that direction we are moving and uh, not only just plain uh, B.Tech degrees, we also offer B.Tech, M.Tech dual degree, M.Tech students also can convert to Ph.D., so on and so forth. And of course, our department is, uh, when you look at it, uh, it actually addresses all the traditional areas as well as the upcoming areas. These are our traditional areas of research. In these areas of research, we conduct um, master's program as well as research programs. And one of the very important things that I would like to inform you is we have very high end laboratories here. And of course, one of uh, the best laboratory that you can see is uh, environmental geotechnics laboratory created by Professor D. N. Singh. Uh, so, similar to that level, I think after years started the trend and obviously in a family when one somebody is growing too fast and too steep, obviously others will not keep quiet. So, that actually helped all others also to catch up and the end result is we have 17 high end laboratories with very good equipment. To give you just one small statistic, in the last 7 years, we have added equipment worth more than 20 crores in the civil engineering department. That is why I advise you to just look at our laboratories and of course, these are the list of the laboratories you can always get from our website and uh, we also have this uh, geotechnical centrifuge which is unique. Uh, in uh, India definitely and also in Asia and you are all geotechnical uh, experts, so I need not explain about it. We are proud to have such a facility and some of the glimpses of some modern equipment that the department has and uh, recently we have actually created uh, a pavement material research laboratory which is almost on par with any super pave technology. So, it will be capable of, it is capable of doing tests which are prescribed under super pave technology. And we also have this driver simulator. Nowadays, you see uh, the talk on accidents. Uh, some of it is attributed towards uh, our behavior. Okay? I cannot say it as bad behavior, but we have our own behavior. We need to change it. So, to understand it, we have those equipment. And as far as department's impact is concerned, in terms of publications, uh, I can proudly say it is more or less number one even in IIT Bombay. Uh, per faculty, we publish four journal papers, uh, high impact quality journal papers. And one of the important things that the civil engineering department has is industry interaction. So, civil engineers of course are very close to the society. They bother about built environment and obviously, they will interact very well with the society and there is also a need. And I am very happy to say that we have reached this mark of 260 million Indian rupees turnover per year only towards consultancy, industry interaction. 
and equal amount through sponsored research okay. Uh, so, so those are the few uh, highlights of our department, I do not want to bore you with uh, the lot of statistics of our department uh, and uh, at the end I will again I will put forward this uh, invitation to the 15th world conference on transportation research for which I am the uh, director of this conference, they call it as local conference directorate okay. So, transportation systems engineering group is the local conference directorate. Uh, it is in fact very difficult to get this conference, we need to bid like uh, bidding for Olympics. So, we uh, won the that bid and then finally got this conference, we are bringing this conference 15th edition of it to IIT Bombay, it will be held in the year 2019 from May 26 to 31st. So, all of you are actually welcome, so please look for this announcement which will of course come in the first week of February. Uh, the kind of process that they follow is similar to transportation research board annual meeting. They will be asking full paper submission directly, okay. Uh, so, one of the points that I would like to mention here is earlier in this conference we were only discussing mainly about transportation systems, operation so on and so forth. But this time when it is coming to India we have insisted that we should definitely discuss about infrastructure design, materials and so on and so forth. So, there is a topic area I, there are A to F topic areas earlier, now the recently with this conference, with this edition we are introducing topic area I, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, okay. So, I conference, I topic is about uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure design and it involves uh, two sub themes, one of the themes is about uh, pavement design, pavement materials anything material research towards transportation infrastructure. So, that way you all come into picture. So, I request you to look at that topic area and submit uh, your great research papers. So, thank you for giving this opportunity. Once again, I welcome you all to this wonderful workshop. I am sure that uh, you will have a lot of takeaways from this workshop and I also congratulate once again Professor D. N. Singh and uh, Professor Megan Hart bringing this workshop here, okay, so thank you very much. I would like to request Professor Babu to say a few words, the President of Indian Geotechnical Society and uh, I hope yeah. you would like to express yeah. himself in front of all of you. I know Professor uh, D. N. Singh for, I mean D. N. S. D. N. S. Uh, for more than 20 years or 24 years I should say that and uh, uh, it is uh, in fact an honor that I am associated with this conference. Uh, why? Because that uh, the environmental geotechnic is an emerging area and uh, it is timely that uh, at the right time, maybe about 20, the moment he joined in IIT Mumbai, he took up this important area and you can see its effect, multiplying effect in terms of the quality of work, uh, qu inspiring number of students uh, in different, uh, now they are all faculty members in different IITs. and. Uh, and for, of course, the IIT Mumbai has provided a very fertile ground for all his ideas. I think the congratulations to all the whole team that they have here, that the ambience that they have built up here. Uh, coming to the Indian Geotechnical Society, I must say that um, I have just assumed I am the president current, currently. But I think we have a lot of ideas, Indian Geotechnical Society is about 70 years history. It has been a very, a very solid, uh, conti I mean a very uh, good society, technical uh, professional society where lot of good ideas are always taken and then implemented. Uh, one of the important things that we want to do is that uh, some of the emerging areas say for example this environmental geotechnics um, is a very, very important area and we want to you know uh, see that. Uh, some of the young faculty will take these ideas, you know, particularly from the forum like this and uh, inspire whole lot of younger generation. I must say that we have what is called student chapters initiative. You know, what is taught in a regular B.Tech level is not sufficient, you know, you teach some two to three courses and close, but the kind of uh, impact that we can make, you know, the, the kind of uh, in, uh, impact that the environmental geotechnic can make for us to have a better society, right? We want clean uh, society, clean water, water, whatever. If you want to do that, clean air and environmental geotechnics is a way. So, if you want to do that, you need to have proper practice and it should start from, you know, student chapters. I mean, I think that way you have a lot of young faculty, young students and of course, Arvin is a good friend of mine. 
we have been i think associated with a very long time i know him very well of course another friend is here and uh, i mean megan heard i'm meeting her for the first time and another friend from uk first time but i'm sure this is a beginning and we want to hear from you and then my role here as professor dns i think he told me that we need to really look at what uh, the young students young minds are speaking and let us observe let us moderate let us understand i think that is the way that i would like to see that that is a takeaway biggest takeaway for me would be that but i'm sure that uh, these activities should go on particularly this environmental geotechnics is something that uh, very close to all of us that's why we are here and um, i believe that uh, we need to generate good ideas and practical things you know actually i must say that uh, when you want to do a good practice in environmental geotechnology it is very disastrous i'm sure in indian context i have a lot of examples like if you want to construct slurry walls you know because a lot of areas are polluted and if you want to construct slurry walls you don't have proper technology in india okay then you don't have proper you have geocentric experts are somewhere here you don't know how to lay the geomembranes properly you know how there are so many defective materials and there are a lot of uh, things you know in geonormal engineering uh, you, the geotechnical has uh, you know has been fine tuned you know if you if you are a good geotechnical engineer then only you can be a good geonormal engineer i'm sure if you don't know compaction properly you can't do liners properly <laughs> i mean so in india what is happening is that you know quality control is very essential and if it is neglected even in any other any other country you know we have to be very very serious and we need to come out with uh, proper guidelines regulations i'm happy that i think there is environmental law expert is going to come in the country like ours or any other similar country we need to understand how you can do good research and come out with some good guidelines you know because it's ultimately you know it is for practice it is for general engineering is for act for practice uh, you need to come out with uh, whatever you talk about um, whether it's landfills whether it is uh, solid waste management whether it is um, you know sustainability or even bio geo interface it's not about few interesting ideas it's about creating ideas and see them that see that we we'll go to actual practical uh, applications uh, i think we'll have one we'll have wonderful time here and i must thank again uh, professor dn singh for organizing this and his team particularly to make this program thank you very much so we'll start with the technical presentations uh, the first one i think to set the stage rolling would be arvin for it arvin about 15 minutes but what i suggest and request to all the participants is that please keep asking questions and uh, we'll keep the motto of the workshop in our mind it's not lecturing it is not a classroom teaching it's just sharing ideas and very informal way any time you feel like asking anything you're most welcome and then we will control the time later on fine yes please okay, right. thank you yes. uh good morning everyone thanks for uh, hosting us here thanks professor dian singh and uh, it's good to see you we've been uh, i remember it was like seven or eight years ago that they came to india and and it was it was a fantastic experience and i that was the first uh, bilateral workshop that I attended uh, between US and India and then we I continued going on US Japan US Russia and again US India here and and all of the problems you see in the field of geo and technical and geo environmental engineering that that you see across the world uh, yes the spectrum is wide the problems are are so different yet the fundamentals are the same and when you think about the solutions that we need to come up with uh, my at least my experience is you could stick in in your field of geotechnical engineering and look for solutions again and again and again and push hard but and spend years and not get to a to a solu uh, perfect solution or you could go wider look in the other fields geophysics chemistry biology and and realize that they have solved this problem already so one of the things that at least my experience should be promoted is multidisciplinary approach to problems. So we got to come outside the box that, that we're comfortable with and, and think about solutions and, and go check other fields. I still remember we spent like almost a year and a half to solve a problem and came up with a solution which, which was working to some extent. And I realized others in other fields had that solution and it was very advanced. So you don't want to reinvent the wheel. 
Uh, and I was lucky to have background in, in electrical engineering and civil engineering, so geotechnical and geoenvironmental to some extent structural, uh, as well as geophysics. And uh, I, I learned my lesson there that from now on, before trying to solve any problem, I go and check every field that, I, that comes to my mind and see if there's any solution. To give you uh, some example, I showed some of the projects that I have here. And I will not go into the technical details too much, but I'll show, I'll just simply show you some of the, the flavor of the technical part and later on a review of some other things that I have done. And you can see that uh, different problems need different, different approaches. To give you some, uh, some background, I uh, personally, for the longest time, I used geophysics basically. Radar based, I heard some of you guys talking about geophysics. Radar based geophysics is what I did. I used electromagnetic waves, GPR, cross borehole radar, TDR, use electric uh, resistivity or impedance uh, spectroscopy to detect things. And later on, I came, I, I started thinking that, okay, remediation is another issue. Can, can we, can we come up with a new tool to solve this problem? And in US, very similar to the rest of the world, groundwater is, is uh, the source of more than 50% of the drinking water. So contamination is a problem. Now, the type of contamination may be different from India, but still, the problem is the same problem. And there has been different solutions, uh, like dig and treat, pump and treat, very costly, destructive methods. Uh, also, there's natural biodegradation. You always got to look at the nature. And, and we engineers obviously look for some solutions. But I envy the scientists because they, they look at the nature and start learning from the nature because at least Mother Earth a couple of billion years. So, uh, and, and Charles, we, were, we had a great discussion yesterday, very short, but it's just I envy scientists and the fact that they go to the nature and, and, and find these these uh, solutions that, that ha over the time have been developed. And in situ, as I said, there's bi natural biodegradation, natural volatilization, and they're pretty slow, but they work. And they have, there has been some, some in situ methods to enhance these uh, uh, volatilization of VOCs or biodegradation. And I looked at different things that were done. For example, I noticed a lot of people used electric kinetics. They used electric current, AC and DC, to improve these processes, to push oxygen uh, through the soil or to, to enhance uh, some, some uh, diffusion and so on and so forth. And I realized all of these methods, and one of the problems with, with us engineers across the world is we come up with a solution, we get excited, we go apply it and not think about the side effects. We don't think long term, at least uh, in a lot of countries that I've experienced, the solutions are pretty short term. So you gotta, the moment you look at the nature come and find the solution, you gotta look at the side effects of that solution as well. When you think about electric current, the first side effect that came to my mind is the temperature rises in the soil and this temperature rise harms the same microbial activities, the very same microbial uh, populations that are in charge of the biodegradation. Or you change the pH of the soil all of a sudden and you kill all the microbes. So pH, the environment it needs to be protected because the ecology that's there has been there for a long time and if, if you agitate that you could harm and, and, and basically cause a side effect worse than the pro initial problem you had. So that's, that, I, with, with that in, my, in mind I thought about okay I've been using electromagnetic waves, what can be done to use them properly? And if you're familiar with different relaxation mechanisms, uh, when you apply an electric field, I don't want to get into the details of that, but you, if you have molecules, if, if you apply current, you can move charged particles. But if you apply elect alternating electric field or electromagnetic fields, then you can oscillate particles that are neutral, yes, dipolar, like water molecules or, or anything that's polar. Then I see a lot of opportunity, Mr. Dalmia, is, his company deals with landfills. Mm -hmm. So he is doing a lot of work related to landfill and I feel that decontamination is going to be a very prime interest to his company. So you should discuss. So we should have our, our final discussion. Can you please raise your hand? She is from Hindalco and she talks about the red mud disposal, which is a big menace in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Rashmi, can you please raise your hand? 
So, see these are the three, four people who are quite going to be quite interested in this type of activities and if we can. Sure. No, no, we should definitely. In India. And of course, uh, Deepak uh, from Keller. Sure. No, definitely. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, open to, as a matter of fact, working with the industry is something that I really enjoy and, and, and uh, we've done. As, as I said before, before getting into this field, I did a lot of geophysical uh, work and, and sensor developments. I worked with a couple of companies, Transtech is, a, is, is one of those, and some other companies, Cyflow and all, to develop sensors for them. But anyway, I thought I could use these, and what, what, by applying the electromagnetic fields, these dipole molecules start oscillating. Obviously, the heavier they are, the faster they relax. The biggest challenge and would be how to implement it in the field. I think somebody should take it up from India and be associated with Arvind because I think this type of uh, applications have never been demonstrated in India. You have done some with? In fact, very recently, I mean, we got a project under the Indo Italian Agility Program. How to use geophysics? If you even look at uh, literature about the one which uh, Professor Singh mentioned as one of the emerging fields, the geo bio interface. Mm -hmm. Probably that biology of So we have a lot of people apart from Charles, Sharad Das is working in this area, Dr. Uday Kala is working in this area, Hanuman is working in this area, and uh, uh, Dr. Patel from IIT Bombay is an expert in this area. Sashank is in this area. Shandel Sahib is an you know, expert in this area from environmental science. And uh, Anup is working in uh, groundwater remediation, I would say. Harshwardhan, uh, you are also interested from MIDI side in this type of things. So there is a big team. Actually, I'm, uh, what I am trying to do is I am just trying to put you guys together along with the speaker. Yes. Was it, was it uh, done in the field? Uh, we the geophysical part I've done in the field, but the environmental we validated different things, and I'll show you different side of this okay. in the lab. I'm working uh, uh, with the comp with a couple of companies, Tetratech as well as Klein Felder, to take this in the field. One of the DoD sites, the part of the defense sites, and try it. Not yet, though. Yeah, well, one thing I want to tell you: you know, India is very flexible in uh, giving opportunity for trial. In the US, you have a lot of legal implications and all that. That's the biggest problem. Your ideas, we are there to help you. I'm oh, sure definitely. We should take it I, I mean, I'm telling you in India that we have a lot of, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, rules are not strict. You know, you can be very flexible and take advantage. And definitely, if you are on, if everybody knows that the product proposal is excellent. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, there will be, you know, I think if some of the industries who are here, if they're ready, yeah. As, as a matter of fact, I'll take this as a good opportunity because uh, next year I'll be on sabbatical, flexible. I already promised uh, a couple of countries. to. I, I promised to spend some time in Poland, uh, promised to spend some time in China and Hong Kong. So I can I can add India to the list and, 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 and come and, 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 and yes. Because, I mean, in India, when we have Maharashtra and Gujarat, these two states are I mean, the issues yeah. and then we have a lot of time for discussion also so we'll go then in the case study so when you're talking about that then right now it's sort of match making yeah. match making which is going on between you know several guys and other speakers experts sure so we should take this opportunity to make matches so anyways, if you look there, you look at that chart, yes, if you look at that chart, you see mechanisms that help you look at different frequencies and different power levels and do, do, do different things. At very low uh, frequency, you can interact with bound water, with heavy metals that are attached to clay, with bound water and so on. You go to higher frequencies, bound water relaxes, you can interact with, with, with free water, you can interact with atoms, with electrons and so on and so forth, depending on the frequency you work on. But this is basically, I can skip these and show you some of the experimental work and results that we did. Every experiment in the lab that we did needed a very controlled environment, so it was done. Uh, it, was, it was done within a cavity, resonant cavity. This is, this is a box made of metal, but a metal that you can see through. Basically transparent, uh, transparent electrically conductive walls.
here. And let me show you some of the images. The way, the, the way we tried it in soil, we tried it in water. Oops. And let me show you. Uh, and then what we did is this is a cavity on the top left corner of that figure. You see that antenna, the loop antenna. It's, we call it ground coupled antenna. It, we, we excite that cavity in there. We'd excite that cavity in there. And then if you look carefully, uh, and uh, obviously we have, we need the simulation, we need the measurement of the electric field, because everything that you simulate, uh, you measure is just limited to point sets of information, so you need to, to validate that. But then what we did is we put these little cups everywhere within that cavity of controlled radiation pattern, and there must be a laser there too, and we injected contaminants within these cups to see whether we can move them where we want to move them. And this is remotely, which means solves a lot of uh, implementation problems. And if I get to this, uh, oh, this is connected to the, the laser, yes. But I, right. if, if you look at this, for example, here we have three cops, and you in, inject this simulant of Dean apples, which is denser than dense than aqueous phase liquids, basically a, a chemical that's denser than water. Naturally, they sink down, reach this impermeable layer, clay layer, and sit there and dissolve gradually and contaminate water. When we apply electromagnetic field, if you go to the next slide, we design the radiation field that would move the contaminants in this direction, and you can see they move. If you go to the next one, we, we design the radiation pattern to move them in this direction, and you can see they move. If you go to the next one, the same here. And all these, the, the, and if you go back, go to the next one, it's a better example, uh, or, or this one and the next. This is the, the best example here. If you look on this one, we, we, we injected the contaminants and they just sink down because they're heavy. The bottom is green. Here, we apply the different frequency, 65 megahertz, and we apply different power, le power levels, 5, 10, 20, 30 watts, and you can see more and more die. You see the green? Keeps going up. Here, we apply the different frequency, 75 megahertz, and, at, and we apply 30 watts of power, which is not much, and we can keep the contaminant contained there for hours and days and weeks. And we can raise this power down to 3 watts in this case, and we can keep the contaminants in there. You shut it off, it gets out. So the big question would be how to implement this technology in the field. Uh, the antenna is up here. The antenna is up here. The antenna is not within the so medium. My, my question would be, what will be the voltage and current which you are going to use in the field? Uh, you can scale it up it and... Not be short circuiting the entire system. No, no, this field. is electromagnetic waves. The antenna is covered with plastic. There's no, there's no corrosion. There's no electric current. There's no uh, heat. The temperature raise in, uh, rise in here is only 1.6 degrees at most. So, degrees. degrees Celsius. What way it is different? Say, electro, electrokinetics has been a standard. That's electric current. You put electrodes. You know, like, you know, I'm, I'm just because that's a standard. Method. Oh, he's talking yeah. about electromagnetism. Yeah. But yeah. does it mean it will be a big difference? Or? Yes, this is the opposite of electric current. With electric current, you allow the electrons to move, but and you, and you don't have much control on this. With electromagnetic waves, this is electric field and magnetic field. There is no current. So your antennas are totally insulated from the medium. There's no there's no flow of electricity. No, and electric, electric current goes well where the conductivity is high. Electromagnetic waves go where there's no conductivity. We can see the sun, which means that even in vacuum or anything. So that, that's quite the uh, differences. But the result of our research was this is the model that, that, that uh, controlled that, that we real, realized controls that. And basically, you have electric field. You have, you have any, any material charged, neutral, polar, nonpolar. You can move them around. And this is basically shows that, that the force that's applied for these cases that moves them up, the yellow arrow, and for these cases that, that uh, another, if you, if you click again, for and again, it shows those. Now, I don't want to get into the details of that and other studies that we've done, but when we applied this, we said, okay, this is great, and this, is, this is shows how much power, when you increase the power, how much more material you can take out of these contamination, either extract them to the surface or to the extra sideways to extraction wells. So that was, that was exciting. And we, then we said, OK, this is a method to be used in, individually. Can we use it as a, as a help for other methods? We tried it with air sparging. If you're familiar with air sparging, you pump air into the soil and you try to uh, vaporize VOCs. 
uh, or feed oxygen to microbes. The problem is when you pump air into the saturated soil, you create tiny channels, we call them L channels, and the air doesn't go anywhere else. Just a sticks right there. Chandana is would be interested along with Dr. Rashmi and Akshita and Jals and you guys please yeah. sit together and just make out some proposal sort of a thing. So when I, I, I as a matter of fact, I went to a company named Tetratech and talked to them and I said, uh, my first question is this, okay, what is that you do? And they said air sparging is 40% is of our business. And then I said, what's the holy grail? What is, is it that you're stuck? And they said, hey, we run these air sparging systems. The air goes somewhere. doesn't work anywhere else. You don't get it clean any, anywhere else. And I said, what do you do? They said, we pulsate the system. We work for a, for a few weeks. We shut it off, wait six months, come back, turn it on. For a few weeks or a month, shut it off, come back in six months. That's a waste of energy and time and cost for us, labor and so on. And I said, I'll find a solution to move these air channels for you elsewhere, which you cannot. And the next uh, part shows you how we can manage to, to control the, these, these zone of influence and the air channels, move them to the right, move them to the left, increase the, the area and the volume that interact with the soil. And we can quickly skip to some of those figures. And we tried it in soil, we tried it in water, if you keep going. The, so this is how we can increase the area of that zone of influence with the amount of power. We start at zero power, go to 30 watts. And 30 watts is not even a bulk for that value. <coughs> so if you scale it up to the field of interest, you probably need may maybe half a kilowatt of power to run this. That's very interesting. Uh, anyways, and, but one thing that's imp important is the initial air pressure before you run the system works. You, cre you open the system, you create the zone of influence, the preferential paths are created, then you can increase the, the air pressure to whatever level you want, nothing helps. The same with electromagnetic waves. Before you create, before you sparge the soil, you run the system, you turn on the system, then you sparge the soil, that helps. If you turn on the system, the channels are formed, you cannot. But the good thing is you can shut them off and, and try a different field and see, see different results. Here, I don't know if you can see it well or not. This is the, the, the top of the soil before the experimentation. This is a symmetric zone of influence. You see the soil particles are moved after the air was injected with no electromagnetic waves. This is with electromagnetic waves at 5 watts to 20 watts. You can see this. For, we wanted to, to change the shape of this, this circle into a human uh, into human lips, and that we managed. We can basically make these things dance. We wanted the shape of human lips. This other one, we wanted a different shape, and you can see how we can push things further to the to the uh, left. Tell me, sir, something can be done in our country, and Deepak, two of you from Keller and Stata. And you bring up this as a new prospect for your industry. What I said is, there's a time when I'm trying to make matches. Yeah, so no. I'm creating a lot of you know coordination between. Yeah, us and uh, I, 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 it wouldn't make much of a difference for me to work with Klein, uh, Klein Feld there, or we with Mr. Or, Dalmia with the white, or with a company in India, and Deepak from Kerala, sure. and then the rest of the academicians. Even so, Arif is there a consultant who can pick up a lot of ideas here. Yes, Arif is there. from it, I just want to say this is a big business opportunity. In fact, I was just mentioning so for that all of our young no, students. No company is there. You just see, you have a lot of one or two ground improvement companies in right. India. Right. Right. Five or six for one billion people or something. Five, six uh, <laughs> ground improvement companies. Soil testing is very bad. So now you have an excellent business opportunity here. True. No company at all. If you want to do some decontamination, there is so much decontaminated. Uh, uh, requirement is there, but there is no company. What is it we are doing here? I mean, it is a shame that we have such a big country. IIAS, IITs are there. We have a lot of research. But things are getting back there. So things are popular. picking it up. No, not the picking it up. Actually, the ecosystem. Ecosystem mm. is not about company. No, no, let, company. Yeah. Companies in the sense, ecosystem is important. You know, but you know, it's a, knowledge has to drive the. You know that it, it, I have other people. Somebody who has a big space, like industry, some longer time in India than the market is still for anything. And there becomes a challenge that all the stakeholders, the owners, our man, the long academia, industry, all the other things we put at the moment. So, one last thing I would say is we try to be things, even the effect on water, the effect on, of micro, on microbial life in there. So we try to, I try to make it comprehensive, 
But in the lab scale, at the lab scale, we, we prove this work. But we need a pilot scale tri trial. And if it works at pilot scale, then we can take it to the field. And all those, tomorrow I'll, I'll have the opportunity to show you other projects and so, some other aspects of this that I looked at and some other things. When you think about tools from different fields and, and put them together, you can see that a variety of different problems can be solved where they're pretty much holy grails and have been holy grails. Yeah, very good morning to all. Uh, myself, Divya, from IIT Palakkad. Uh, I very recently joined at IIT Palakkad, so I don't have any uh, much research to show. I am just showing my research areas of interest. Actually, I was working with uh, landfill cover barriers. Uh, the differential settlement behavior of the landfill cover barriers was the area of uh, which I have concentrated till now. And my research areas of interest includes uh, green geotechnics, that is, uh, towards uh, the green geotechnics means uh, like the geotechnology towards environmental protection. That is, I would like to concentrate on sustainable landfills like bioreactor landfills. And uh, uh, basically, like when we talk about sustainability, we know that a landfill is not a completely sustainable solution because of the large areas of the land which is required and also because of the contamination, we know. So we should put some emphasis on the value addition and utilization of the potential waste materials, potential waste materials, whatever is uh, capable of doing. And then I would like to concentrate on the uh, sustainable ground improvement techniques by utilizing the waste byproduct and the various application of uh, geosynthetics in geotechnical and geoenvironmental applications. So in uh, green geotechnics, now the proposed research areas, which I would like to immediately concentrate on, is like with the aim that minimum waste should go to the landfill. First, I would like to concentrate on the value addition and utilization of potential waste materials in various geotechnical applications, like the sustainable practices in soil stabilization. And uh, very like recent publications, it is showing that some of the uh, materials are having potential in using embankments and uh, uh, retaining wall backfill. So I would like to concentrate on the value addition of this waste material. And whatever uh, effort we are putting for the uh, utilization of the waste material, some of the waste will ultimately go to the landfill. So in that case, uh, conventional landfill, we know that in the case of MSW landfills, it will take a lot of time for the stabilization for about 50 to 100 years. We are using a very large area of land. And in India, if we uh, see, uh, many of the urban cities in India are having lot of waste dumps, not scientifically uh, like provided with the liners, uh, covers. Now, a lot of waste dumps are there and uh, which need to uh, remediate. And the situation is like we should have a properly designed waste containment system with uh, provision of uh, barriers on bottom sides and covers. So when we talk about sustainable landfill, we should uh, put emphasis on bioreactor landfill, where the leachate is uh, recirculated. So I would like to work on bioreactor landfills. And when we talk about the coal ash, red mud, all these things are creating problems. And it is, uh, see some, yeah, some of the waste byproduct, which has some potential is the coal ash, red mud. Coal ash, uh, we know that our electricity generation is predominantly from uh, the coal-based thermal power plants, red mud, and rice husk ash, which is an agricultural waste product, and uh, uh, ground granulated blast furnace slag. So all these things are having some potential, uh, like for the uh, uh, soft clay improvement, we are using some conventional materials like lime, cement, and all these things. They are effective, but still, the production of these materials are energy conservative. So we can use this waste byproduct uh, for uh, ground improvement techniques for the soil stabilization. And when we talk about this coal ash and copper slag, these materials are having bulk utilization in the fields, embankments, or making the reinforced uh, backfields and all these things. And very recently, some studies have been reported at IIT Delhi. This copper slag is very good in using as the backfill. But uh, and uh, but whatever is the application we are telling, some of the waste materials are ultimately going to the uh, waste ponds, like the coal ash, red mud. All these things are accumulated very uh, in the vicinity of the uh, plant itself. 
So some, yeah, we all are aware about the waste disposal issues and I don't have to tell about the breaching and all these things. Yeah, I've seen that like the waste materials like ash pond itself, it is used for the incremental raising of the embankment. The waste material can be used for the embankment and all these things. But when we use this industrial, so when we are using this industrial waste product in the soil stabilization or when, the, when we are using as the backfill, the main problem which uh, I was thinking is that uh, most of the pa cases we, we may have to provide the drainage, adequate drainage, filters and all these things we have to provide. And some cases we are providing this ash pond dikes. We are using the waste material itself for incrementally raising the embankment dams. So, and conventionally we are using some uh, gravel or sand sized material as the uh, filters and drains. But we can replace it with the geosynthetic, we know that geocomposites can be effectively used. Okay, we just talk about G16 meter size. Yes. Expect that they answer all the questions. You said that it's like a flash and flash embankment is free. Yeah, yeah. It is not uh, flash is good, but we attribute it yes. to flash, not actually there are so many soil failures, hundred soil failures, one flash embankment. Embankments, slope failures have been reported. You know, because our design issue is not correct. Like yes. You know, there is an hydraulic uh, flow is different. Yeah. Particle sizes, particle mass. There are so many fundamental issues uh, where, unfortunately, the person has given a criteria, but we still follow it blindly. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that. So, my only thing is that here is an opportunity to understand the fundamental matter. Yes. You know, and refine the filter calendar, I wish. Yes. And go ahead. And that is my opinion. So, the hydraulic compatibility of these waste materials with the uh, drainage like filters and drain that has to be so that is the immediate research plan which is there in my mind. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Narayanan Nethalath. I am from Arizona State University. Thank you Dr. Singh for uh, for inviting us and Hello. getting this. So, um, we have been hearing about waste management, waste disposal. I work mostly on cement and concrete um, uh, and do you know few other things also. Uh, but we'll probably change a little tack here and do something different and come back to all the other things, right? So we'll have some variety, right? All of you good with that? Early morning, okay. So this is a picture that I show, so that you will not go back and tell. I just did not get anything that this guy spoke about, right? You at least would have seen a picture that you will remember, okay? So. Um, the couple of pictures on the top is the university that I am from. That's the largest public university in the United States with about 80,000 students. Um, we are the largest public university. You know, it's it's like it's like a big city in itself. And then the bottom picture, I'm sure all of you know what that is, right? Which is only about a four-hour drive from where we are. Okay, so few things that uh, that I work on dev uh, generally: new materials, developing new materials for infrastructure. Uh, looking at materials from and that's probably what I'll talk a little more today looking at materials from a point of view of designing them for the purpose that you need it rather than randomly creating stuff uh, based on microstructure based on what actually are the mechanisms that govern the response of the material at different scales. So we do a lot of sustainable materials um, developing newer techniques for sustainable materials newer ways of um, using CO2 sequestration for for, for materials. CO2 sequestration, carbonation for soil strengthening, a lot of different stuff. So um, today I'll, I'll, and we do some sensor system sensors for, um, for evaluating concrete and soil properties. So uh, the things that that are are fairly important, especially in a place um, where you have disasters that are exacerbated by soil properties like earthquakes, right? Um, it's commonly said that earthquakes don't kill people. It is the buildings that fail that kill people, right? So, how do we make resilient infrastructures, resilient structures and soils that are um, that are amenable to large deformations like um, liquefaction? So, I mean, there are a lot of techniques. You know, you have grouting, you have um, you have soil different variety of soil strengthening methods. But what we have recently, um, and what the, one of the techniques that is recently coming up is microbially induced strengthening techniques. Microbially induced carbonate precipitation, enzyme induced carbonate precipitation, so that you can precipitate calcite or any of those carbonate species within soil through bacteria or through enzymes 
in a large scale so that and re you really don't need to strengthen soil to make it concrete. You need only a very small amount of strengthening. Creating a few bridges between liquefiable soils is enough. The problem in a large scale in a, in a, in a place like California which is, which is a huge earthquake prone area, the problem actually is, is there are varying levels of how much of carbonation do you actually need. Are there ways of doing it? And then if I am looking at 100,000 square kilometers, I can't go and take soil samples from every place and do experiments, right? Anybody who has walked into a lab and has done experiments will know how time consuming it is, um, how picky experiments are. I had a professor at one point of time, I was working on concrete, so he said, you know, I had this beautiful graph with wonderful results, right? You, you match all the points nicely with nice fits. So he came and said, Concrete doesn't behave the way you want it to behave, it behaves the way it wants it to behave, right? Very similarly, right? Soils also. You, you can do wonderful experiments at the end of the day, um, there's only so much you can do with experiments, the time that it takes. There are two problems. The first thing is that we can't be able to densify the material first. Because the moment you are starting densification, so it gives erratic results, erratic density. Every time you do it, rather than each time you do it, you will give a different unit weight and different weight. Okay, then I try to, in a very rudimentary way, I try to stabilize it, nothing worked. Well, the second thing is that, so if I want to utilize any material for geodesical purpose, I need to have a minimum scale. There's only any minimum scale. Another problem is that, whatever the material you is in it, it starts to regain the pH, the pH is around 30. The moment you introduce any material, the uh, pH starts decreasing. But after some time, again, it goes back to the same level. They produce uh, bauxite and the byproduct which is being produced is the red mud, having a lot of high pH value. Mm -hmm. This is what is discussing. Dr. Vashmi, any comments? Uh, what do you want to use it for? Nandaj, any comment? Nandaj is doing this experiment. I don't want to say practical point of view, nothing is it. Because the moment I mean HCL, the chloride can be in the barometer. So that is not possible. In fact, we can use HCL also. Uh, See, we talked about precipitation. Soils that are already laden with ash and things like that, no, right? High high alkaline alkaline high soils. High. Yeah, so we are talking about really the regular soils that are and uh, my colleagues are doing work on, I mean, again, I'm not a microbiologist, maybe Charles has so we'll better this answers question. to this, but we'll keep, we'll these keep, this question keep these questions, keep these questions, but I can help you in certain other ways which we'll go forward. So, neutralization is a big issue, everybody is struggling, right. I'm sure. Yeah, it depends on the type of soil, right? This is, this is not a technology that you can put in any type of soil. There are, there are. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's it's research on it. We'll see. Right. So, so the 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 idea is the idea is there's no one solution fitting all for any infrastructure problem, right? You have to you have to do it with with whatever. But you know, I'll I'll tell you a few things that that we'll go with. Um, there's another te technique that one of our my colleagues have done, which is um, uh, which is uh, using biopolymers. Bio strengthening using biopolymers. So, you do not have to really rely on bacteria, biopolymers which are plant based biopolymers which actually has worked in, in a few things. So, my focus and I am a material scientist, structural engineering material scientist by training. So, um, microbiology is interesting, chemistry is very exciting, but I am actually looking at why would this work, right? Somebody will come and say, yeah, it works. I am instantaneously thinking, what is that particle scale mechanics that makes it work? The idea is, I do not want to be doing and I am mostly an experimentalist and especially if you are, um, um, I know you, you guys probably might not be very um, used to how the academic system in the US works. If I have to have a PhD student, I have to make money for him, right? So, I have, so I have to create that resource. So, I am very hesitant to let any student go into the lab and do random experiments. Anytime a student walks into the lab, I drain money. So, we really have to be careful about what we are doing and really hypothesis driven research and trying to understand what happens at a particle fundamental scale so that we can do minimal experiments and get maximal 
uh, results. So, um, one of the things that we have used especially this I have done this for, um, for um, concrete rheology flowing of concrete from back of the truck. We are actually doing 3D printing of concrete now. Um, I have a project with IIT Madras that we are looking at 3D printing concrete. Again same idea how does the particles of cement paste or particles of concrete get together and stick together and what kind of forces make them live together as a printed unit um, when you when you start printing them. So, same idea here if I have two blocks of sand or two particles of sand that is connected by a calcite bridge which is what you want to make your soil strong what makes it strong? How does it stand so that we can really understand it and it is nothing but fundamental physics and that is what it makes all all very interesting uh, because you know it all comes from Newton's second law, Newton's second law of motion which we have learned when 6th standard, 7th standard right. Um, so, we will we'll, I'll, we'll do details in a, in a later talk whenever we have to, but I will just give you the big picture of what we are doing uh, with it. So, basically what you have is you have all these particles and this is especially for, for PhD students who are doing research and if you are into modeling um, and if you want to get into modeling um, it is it's, it's kind of important to understand at what level you want to play around. Uh, because you know there is nanotechnology, there is there is sub nanos, there is atomic scale modeling, but from an infrastructure point of view you have to understand what is that scale that excites you, what is the scale that you want to apply something in the field. We are now looking at meters and meters of, of of sand strata being strengthened, you probably do not want to go to sub nano scale and things like that right. You want to look at the part scale of size of sand sand particles or the soil particles. So, discrete element method where you can take each of these particles individually, think of each of them as individual bodies and now what you are looking at is failure or any failure of a structure which is like a soil structure being a large deformation problem right. You can think of these things moving either with respect to each other or independently of each other. So, what are the laws that govern the movement of these particles if I can solve the equation or those sets of equations you have a good understanding of what makes these thing work. If you have any questions stop me and ask so that um, you know we can we can get those discussions going. So, that is the idea you can you have particles of sand um, you have particles of soil you want to strengthen it I want to strengthen it to a certain level what makes the bridges that form between these particles take those loads. So, I have a doubt here when we talk about discrete element method and once you are doing MICP or strengthening of the particles by coalescing them, mm -hmm. it becomes a cohesive law. Yeah, well, well, else, else. We will get there, we will get there that is that is a challenge. So, here comes the next cohesive law oh. ok. So, you get those particles. So, you have particles like that discrete particles and you have um, you have a few mathematical relationships that you put together to describe that collective particle. So, you have two calcite particles joined by a bridge, calcite cladding the particles, you have variety of different things in the shear stress between those particles you can account for all of that. So, um, not to bore you with too much of math, but the basic idea is again going back if I have two particles coming together and if if the if I want to make them move again 3 degrees of freedom right. You have normal force, you have shear force or that particle can rotate. If I can solve those three equations this these are all cohesive frictional materials. So, it is all cohesive frictional there is there is interface friction and there is cohesion different levels of cohesion that is a shear cohesion that you provide to the particles that is it. Is it a function of the normal stress? It is it is a like big function of the normal stress yeah. yes it has to be right I will show that. Uh, um, the one of the big challenges in discrete element modeling is yeah how many. So, if I want to take a take a, a bucket of sand and model it how many particles do you think will be there of in a bucket of sand? roughly millions. millions of particles. If I want to have so, we, we try this experiment if I have to have a million particles and use this cohesive law for every particle that is touching each other under a certain compaction level I need the Texas advanced computing cluster that contains I do not know how many giga bits of I need that Texas advanced computing cluster computer to run for three and a half months it is not happening right they are they are they are doing other things. So, we have to scale it down, but the advantage with discrete element method is once you get away from the boundary of the structure that you are looking at once you have covered the boundary effects 
then the number of particles really don't make uh, make a, make a huge difference because it is then every individual particle interacting with it you just have to overcome that boundary effect so we have done it with 10000 particles that will take probably in in your good um, workstation probably about a day what do you mean particle behavior no, so these are all you have to define the constitutive law. The particle it has to behave. The particle has to adhere by whatever laws of nature that it has to adhere with. You, yeah, you have to have whatever constitutive laws that govern two particles. So again, this is how I teach my students, right? So if if you want to model human behavior, you want to model normal human behavior, not abnormal human behavior, right? So abnormal is different. Uh, so, whatever is a normal interactions will, will work perfectly well. So, very, very simple ideas. You have two particles, there is a normal stress. So, let's say you question on you have a normal stress. And again, if you do any structural engineering class, the first thing that you say is anything that is normal is a spring, right? Anything that damps is a dash pot. Anything that slides is a slider. Anything that rotates is a rotator. You have those four elements, and you can have all those. Uh, constitutive loss and nicely linear elastic constitutive loss that govern all of that. You can do nonlinear loss also, but that will take more time to solve. But this, so the idea is we use these methods. So once, once um, we know that I need 2 percent of calcite to be um, deposited in a certain strata to improve my unconfined compressive strength or my um, drain triaxial compressive strength or whatever is that number from x to 1.2 x. So if I need 20 percent improvement, 2 percent is what I need. I can implement these models to exactly predict what kind of calcite distribution you need so that whoever is doing in the field can go and inject it at certain points. So now we are not randomly injecting, you are telling based on the soil that you have, based on soil properties that you have, based on soil permeability that you have, here is how you design your, uh, your, your injection columns. So now you go back and design what you actually have to do through these models rather than randomly saying okay let me do it at 2 meters and see what I get. Right, so that's the idea. Of course, we did a lot of trials to to to. Um, so your perception is actually different than what we have. Okay. Uh, in the entire discrete element modeling, I mean, you should be having a sample on which you can do the tests, and you can come out with the constitutive relationship. That's what we have done. Uh, unfortunately, we are still struggling with creating a sample. And then, so that you can use that to calibrate your discrete element model. Is that, is that the idea? Yes. Okay. okay. So, here is what, here is my suggestion. In experiments, you will never get two samples to be identically the same. You are, you are expecting um, the real ideal scenario which is not going to happen. But what is the tolerance that you can give? What variability can you afford to have? And historically, the smaller you go, the harder it is to control the variability of any sample, whether you do concrete, whether you do whatever, smaller you go because in a larger sample the flaws are distributed uniformly, you homogenize the effect. The smaller and the smaller and the smaller you go, you do not get the, the flaws are unique by themselves and you do not get the same response. So you go to a really small sample and try to replicate, you will have trouble. So you have to look at what tolerance you want, you probably have to go to a larger sample. And then you say that. I have I have a 4 inch diameter sample and theoretically if I calculate I am probably will have 75,000 particles in that sample. Will I be able to do with 5,000 samples on a sized scale specimen which will give me the same set of properties because lab to models we are not yet there very very hard especially when specimens are small. Any material that is a rule of materials, the more the smaller and the smaller and the smaller you go with any material, you will localize the flaws. That is that is why I said you know what is the tolerance that you have right, what is that balance between heterogeneity that you have in the larger scale and the total masking of the actual effect by a flaw in a smaller sample. Yeah, so right. Basically, sample preparation itself is a big issue. It is a big issue, yes. This is where at least uh, all of us are struggling I would say, you know making a candidate sample for deriving the constitutive laws 
itself is a big question mark. Correct. Um, so, what, what we have done is we have done, I will show you some examples as we go through. Um, there are there are few things that we have done. So here are our, our normal tangential and and um, and rolling constitutive laws. I'll just quickly give you a few our our actual target samples for. So this is a bounding box that we've used, which is a two inch diameter, two inch size by four inch, no, two centimeter, two inch size by four inch long, two inch cross section by four inch long sample that we have used for calibration of all our results. So all the tests were done on a 2 by 4 sample and then that is what we have we have all numerically simulated. So you know how do we pack the particle. So what we do here I will show you this quick video um, if that works apparently yeah it works. So you see right. So basically the idea is again so this is another another mathematical trick that you play to make sure that the computational time is short as well as you equilibrate all your defects. So basically you do not put all the particles in a box and say this is my volume for simulation. Then you are predefining whatever particles that you are putting and then you have no control over what is happening right. So I do not predefine particles if you see here if you see the start of it you see small seeds. You throw in those seeds and I grow my seeds. I agree. So this is a basically moving boundary problem. Yes. Where the particle itself is becoming larger. Yes. Boundaries are moving. Yeah. Particle boundaries are moving within constraints. Then time dependency comes in the picture. Time dependency associated with the material property comes in the picture. It will not, no. Because you have not started doing the test then, right. This is only, this is pre-conditioning of the sample. So, the sample is not there. Whatever you see until now is not the sample. I am doing a computational expediency okay. These are to make. particles sitting together. These are seeds sitting together. Okay. I am growing the seeds. I am telling the seeds you should not overlap. I am telling them you should have a total porosity of so much in the system. I am telling you that, I am telling the particles that you should have a certain coordination number and all of that. Uh, you can do different things. I, we have we have done it with whatever is particle size distribution you can have. You can depends, right? So if you if you give them a particle size distribution and you give a particle size distribution of soil and you know a unit volume, you know how many particles of those. So it will randomly choose which particle to grow how much to get you the target porosity. At the end of the day, you need a target porosity, right? So that's that's what we do. I'm I'm sorry, but how to control the porosity of the system? Here is it. a big question. Okay. That cannot be controlled. Here comes right. So you 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 do a consolidation, right? So when you do a lab lab exam lab experiment, so so this one has a video where we do the. So this is drain track cell compression. We do undrained also. So this is what you have at this point. There's no cohesion. These are individual sand particles. This is an a non-strengthened simple sand that is very liable to liquefaction. Right, so you know there is no cohesive bond. These are individual discrete sand particles. They'll just move, slide, do all of that. So the way we do this cohesion, is, so here is where you have a sand grain with calcite. So if you look at the microstructure, you can have calcite either cladding the sand grain, or you can have at higher concentrations you can have calcite bridges. So basically, the way we did it is we again simplified the problem and said we defined a cohesive model where you gave a cohesive shear strength to the particles. And that cohesive shear strength apparently, I will jump to the, the slide for that, that cohesive shear strength basically scales very well with the shear wave velocity. Makes sense, right? Shear wave velocity is a function of shear stiffness and the cohesional strength, the more cohesion you have, the more shear stiffness you have. Therefore, you measure the shear wave velocity, that is your input as shear stiffness. So are you able to measure the shear wave velocity at particle level? No, no, this is bulk level. Shear wave velocity measure the bulk level. The bulk, level. bulk sample. Okay, yes. We can always do it. Yeah, you can always do in the lab. You can always particle contact remains same for all other particles. It will not. But that's that's a that's a problem, right? When you have when you're having ten thousand particles, you're saying that these are the individual constitutive laws or behavior of the particles which is adhered to in the complete uh, set. Now the question is, do I have the same cohesion between two sand particle sands of sand? No, I don't have, right? But in the modeling, what you do is you have to globally so average. So you are targeting some particular cohesion. Yes, that's why that's why we went back the other way and said I can sit in the lab and start cal and sit and calibrate my model for days together and ages together, uh, and I can refine and refine and refine and refine. Or I can go back and tell somebody to put in a 5 meter by 5 meter sand pit and carbonate it and, and predict it and go measure the are you seeing 
the strength thing, I'm predicting this much, are you seeing it? Right? So you go back and, and recheck what is happening. Reverse, kind of reverse engineering, but models being otherwise these models will remain academic, right? You can sit in the lab, you can you can use all of those, pictures will be very nice, PhD defense will go wonderfully well, but nobody will use it. So now, now we, we go back and say, okay, put this pit in, put your uh, you know, I am predicting that you can put in 2 meter intervals and I am predicting this level of carbonation. Go see if you can get it. Core, generally large scale correlations and you can match the data to see what shear wave velocity. Actually what one of my students have done is to take 2 sand particles, glue them together and we have an atomic force microscope. So, pull them and see what basically you know if you have 2, point, two spherical particles with 1 point of contact. Um, that is an infinite stress problem, right? Um, which if I if I do if I just simulate that, it will take ages to solve because solution will never converge. It is an infinite stress problem. So, we actually did experiments on gluing it by you know on on flat plates, put these particles and then put the uh, pull the try to pull the plate away. Uh, I do see Prasad Prasad Bhattakya's papers on what is the influence of morphology on the shear wave velocity. Mm -hmm. so, Prasad Bhattakya did this work and we have quantified the morphology and the shear wave velocity together to show how liquefaction potential okay. reduces uh, with because of coalescing of the particles yeah, right, right. because of the aging of the sand seal. Right? Yeah, and, and then apparently so and, and then you do not need too much of uh, too much of calcite yeah. precipitation to have very small amounts will do it. Yeah, there is a myth that you should yeah, put yeah, more and more exactly. into the system. Yes, very, very I will actually show you, I will actually show you yeah. since we talked about that here is a, here is my my simple shear, but we are doing it in the centrifuge at UC Davis. Because most of us are not aware of AFM, we have okay. never used it. Okay. Um, see, so this is my simple direct shear um, experiment, and then I will show you the results. What you see on the left is a carbonated sand, what you see on the right is a non carbonated sand. Um, okay. um, you can see, you see the difference in, in the spectra. Now, atomic force microscopy is a technique, um, it is a, it's a you know technique that we use to look at. So, basically think of a cantilever, think of a cantilever with a very sharp pointed tip at the nano scale. So, you are talking about 10 to the minus 9 meters, right. So, you have a surface, say so think about this surface. This glass, all of you agree that is very, very soft, uh, sorry very smooth, but how many would say that this is rough? How many would rough when depending on the scale that I which I that which I look at right. So, if a, a nano scale tip rasters over the surface that tip will give you depressions like a Grand Canyon because this is not really smooth. Um, so, what atomic force microscopy does is and so similarly between particles you know that when a particle is in contact with something else and it is frictionally held, it is the surface areas that matter. The surfaces that are holding it matters. So, if it is really smooth, I have a point contact. If, it, if I have ridges, I have multiple contacts, right. That is why you have seen all these lizards go up the wall. How do they go up the wall, right? We, we cannot go, but they can go because, yeah, they, they have this suction at that very small scale they are able to, to, to hold on to it that we are not able to because the scale is so different. So, atomic force microscopy does the same thing. So, you can raster these surfaces and look at the profile of what that surface is. In what way it is different than the laser profiling of a surface? Um, the scale. The, so, if, if I take a sand particle with cladding of, of calcite around it. I can raster those surface and tell you exactly what the thickness of sand cla of calcite cladding is. Uh, at um, SEM microscopy will give so you that reasonably well. Level yes, you can go nano level, nano level. Yeah. So the the biggest application that we have used it is uh, one of the questions that that we constantly ask is what size of calcite crystals do you need? Do you need large crystals or do you need small crystals? And and the jury is out on that. You will see literature telling you both. Some people will say, ah, we, I like large crystals, some people will say you need finer crystals, right. So, the question is what will those crystals do and what is the effect of those crystals on uh, on the interface strengths and that is what we, we look at with an atomic force microscope. Very interesting thing actually what we should be doing is all of us who are working in MICP, uh, let us create our samples and maybe if you uh, 
are ready to collaborate. Yeah, like we can send these samples to you. AFM, we have an ID Bombay. By yeah, way. yeah, just do it and and. and um, uh, but I think I'm sure our people have to be trained on this. And yeah, we have to understand how to decode the results. Take a lot of time. AFM um, asked them to get a bigger tip. You can always get a different tip. Maybe that's a tip that they have and they don't want to change the tip. Changing the tip is like you know. Um, the, it is it is a much more refined version of trying to put in a, a thread through a needle hole, right? We all know how dif difficult that is, right? Sometimes it just happens, sometimes it never happens. That's how changing the tip is. It comes with experience, it comes with doing a lot of those. So, yeah, changing the tip because these are really, really small things and if you accidentally drop it, you are gone. Now, you can take your take your sample, touch it with the hand and do an AFM, you will get completely different results because your hand can make an imprint on all these samples that is large enough to, to make. So, sample preparation makes a lot of time, you have to really polish it well, coat it with epoxy. So, the way we do it is we put the sand particles in epoxy, we grind it so well to get a surface profile and then slightly rotate the sample to do the rest of the sides. So, it takes a lot of time. Nano indentation is much more, much more robust than AFM. If you, if you have problems with nano indentation, AFM will be an Everest to climb. Nano indentation is much more, much more easier. If you do concrete, for example, how do you prepare concrete for a backscattered SEM? That's exactly the same procedure you do for nano indentation. You do nothing different. Uh, very, 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 very difficult. So you have electrostatic charge is a problem. So you have to do some charge suppression. If you have charged particles, you have to do so. Um, you have to stick it on to certain adhesives that are charge suppressing. Yeah, if you have yeah. and if if you if you really need smooth surfaces, yeah, then you would do sputtering. But what when we have looked at what we've done is we have um, we have um, um, impregnated sand and epoxy, so that kind of suppresses most of those charge. So we'll just look at surface profiles and the roughness of uh, of the particles. This is basically clay platelets. Yeah. So, that makes all the difference. Yes. So, when you cannot impregnate something into a matrix, you should ask a question why. Right. And this is where actually his answer comes. No, also um, when you when your system goes back, for example, he was talking about pH issues, right. Um, none of the simulations that I have shown you today considers any reaction at all. So, reactive transport, reactive. So, if you if you look at atomistic modeling and that is probably something that you guys should look at if, if some of the research students are interested, there is something called react FF modeling, reactive atmosphere, at, um, reactive atomistic force field modeling, which actually works well for these kinds of systems because you can consider these sand particles as atoms if you want and then you can consider the reactive force fields. So, now you can look at introduce carbonate dissolution. You can introduce kinetics of these reaction into it. Now it becomes a much more yeah, interesting clog, problem. Clogging. You can do clogging. Yeah, it becomes it becomes even more you know, complicated. Option mechanisms yeah. on the particles. Yeah. Then then it becomes an even more um, even more. No, uh, my intention is not to make this a modeling workshop, but just 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 give you um, give you a feel for a few things. Smooth. So that's why you have to impregnate it into an epoxy or something, and then polish it. And when you polish it, no, there is a problem. You are exposing. So, if you take a sphere, impregnate and cut, you are getting a flat surface at some point. Now, you have to do statistically significant number of tests on that to give you an idea. So, one poke, one scratch is not going to get you. Then, you, then it, it becomes a probabilistic mechanics problem. Egan is going to talk about this impregnation of systems in another system. So, so that, that is something that you Permeable have to. Reactive barriers how these barriers react with something which is permeating through it, the whole concept and the physics of it. So, we have done cone penetration to, um, to actually look at um, uh, you know what kind of changes you get if you, if you, um, if you penetrate a cone with a carbonated system or calcite precipitated system. And um, you asked if I can have different particles. So, that picture simulation is, is with different particles and giving different values of cohesive strength of the particles. So, all of this what we have done these simulations, I do not know what DEM software you guys use. Do you use PFC 3D? Yeah, we have this. Uh, what, what software no, do you use? What this thing finite? Uh, DEM. DEM we are using. Itasca, Itasca. Oh, Itasca, that is PFC 3D, yeah, PFC, PF particle flow code. But um, we do none of those commercial stuff, we do all open source, we write our own codes. So, all these are based on um, our own Linux codes. It is called YAID, 
um, it is so it has some basic structures written C++ okay. so we write our own codes okay. and then um, merge it in the bigger engine and solve. So basically the advantage is that I am I am traditionally opposed to using black boxes because I do not know how black boxes work. Uh, this we do our equations so if there is a mistake I know where I am I'm making a mistake more more laborious for a student to do it because there is no GUI there is no visual interface so you have to write the programs for everything but much more controlled because I know what is happening behind the scenes. So in reality what you are having in calcite precipitation is two different ways of calcite precipitation. If you have a low amounts of calcite that is precipitating typically less than 1 percent of calcite calcite crystals clad the sand grains or cover the sand grains. If you have lot of calcite coming in calcite crystals bridge the sand grains. So, if two mechanisms bridging mechanism or cladding mechanism. If it is a cladding mechanism I have sand and calcite cladding. So, it is still a sphere I can use my contact loss as some kind of a homogenized particle. This one particle now bears the signature of both sand and calcite. So, that I can I can do the modeling or I can take that sand particle create one interface around it and use that as, as a modeling tool whichever way you want. But if I have bridges now that becomes a difficult problem because a discrete element software typically the way it is written can take only regular sized uh, shapes. So, I can have two particles connected by cylinders connected by another sphere connected by bridges. But if you look at micrographs even though you know calcite has a hexagonal morphology not all bridges are hexagonal you will see different shapes right. So, if you really want to take care of different shapes then it becomes a computationally intensive problem. So, what we have done is we said if here are two bonds so it is called a virtual bond now. I have two particles and I have a virtual bond that connects the two particles that virtual bond is my calcite grain I do not care what shape of that grain is and how it grows it is just a virtual bond and the shear wave velocity gives me what is the shear stress of that bond. See that is true you can get the correlation but still at the microscopic level if you really want to look into how the contacts are yes. developing or what the surface is shear wave velocity is a black box. Yes absolutely it is a black box. So, it cannot differentiate between yes. the surface and the contact mm -hmm. So a very difficult aspect to decipher. Correct. So, atomic force microscopy AFM will give you if you do it really carefully give you an indication of what the um, cohesive interface stresses are you can get that um, and then you can back calculate and see if your shear wave velocity is in the ballpark uh, right. Otherwise, um, so one of the biggest issues is very challenging uh, is being done by Vijit and the I mean they are working on gas hydrates we okay. will discuss tomorrow right. So, where the hydrates are growing and similar contact is getting created bridge between the two particles because of the <coughs> thermodynamic stability. Uh, that part again is another issue which we are yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that is that is growing in a liquid phase. Just discuss with him maybe whenever you get Yeah. So, so if you if you look at just just to give you uh, give you um, some some pointers. I had a colleague at one point of time who did a lot of work on gas and methane hydrates Pujida Yapa. Um, look at his papers he has done a tremendous amount of modeling when the deep water horizon spill happened. Uh, the US government came to him and so a lot of people were predicting where the deep water horizon oil is going only his model predicted where it will end up. Yeah, so these are very intriguing models actually yeah. I think you should discuss a bit more about how the dynamics is. Okay. Can I if you know the right properties of materials model can give models can give you whatever you want. But if you do not know what the properties are models also are a black box you have to know what you tell me so for example, I do a lot of work with cement and fly ash with a cement particle day in and day out wherever that cement is made whichever country I know exactly how much of C3S, how much of C2S, how much of C3A, how much of C4F I can do it every day. With fly ash I can never do that because every fly ash is different right. So, that becomes a very challenging problem then you are you are doing it only for one particular scenario again I mean we, we have fly ashes from five different power plants and five of them be behave completely well even though they fall under the same ASTM standard. ASTM C618 everything is satisfied but the behavior is completely different right. So, you yeah it is very difficult. Plus dissolution which is going on. Yeah react that is again I have never gotten to reactive transport reactions is, is a whole reactive chemistry is a whole different field by itself. Do the cross section in different sections see the all the 
voids and porous in different layers. Yeah. So that's one that I think. Second, you did, I think, four dimensional x ray tomography. Oh, I have some so x ray tomography pictures. Why did you discuss your results with both of them? Yeah, we have done some um, 4D x ray tomography on, on these particles actually on, on the sand systems. But the problem with x ray tomography in, a, in, in an MICP or a EICP or a calcite precipitated system is your sand and calcite has very similar relative densities. So, to pick up from an x-ray source which is sand and which is calcite shape yes I will show you some pictures it is uh, you have to have a really good eye and then you should believe some magic too for that to happen. Yeah. I do not know much about discrete modeling so I would like to ask how you model the prospect if a glass is migrating in a system how you model the voids? Model what? Voids. Loss. A discrete element model considers only interaction between the elements that you have defined. So, if you want flaws or, or voids, that's not a method. That's not a good method. You probably should do something else which is more microstructurally conservative. This is discrete element models. Do only in the particle. In the particle. So, but in actual case, sign your diagram is different. Sign your diagram is different. How will sign your diagram is different? That's what I said. Once you, again, you do some trials to see what size work, but once you go beyond a certain size, once you negate the boundary effects, because boundaries will exert a lot of effects on this, because particle. Now, in every discrete element model, typically what you do, your boundary also has similar properties to the particles. Boundaries to different particles and particle movements, you can't control them. Right? So, you have to have the same contact law that matches. So, once you go away from the boundary, you have kind of a homogeneous system. So, the particle number is dependent on uh, on how far you are away from the boundary and how much of reduced oscillations you get. So, if you, if you actually start to start to do an undrained or a drained triaxial compression, you start to get your, your excess pore pressure with your axial strain. When you start to plot the excess pore pressure with your axial strain, you will initially get a lot of oscillations because the system is trying to stabilize itself. 